All right, so we'll go, we'll hop right into it. So this is the review, the official review for our technical fundamentals and our technical fundamentals are based on the CompTIA A plus um, and the course itself is based on the Google support course. So this is a track to get you into your first entry level job in IT as a support specialist, an IT specialist, a system analyst, or a system administrator. So this will definitely get you started in, on your career path and these are the fundamentals. So the test that we're gonna be shooting for is the CompTIA A+. If you don't have any IT experience at all and no degree and you are just trying to get in the field, then the CompTIA A+, will definitely be um, beneficial for you to not only know about, but to uh, go ahead and get, it's about $250, uh, you get a 75% on the exam and uh, you'll pass it. This is the entry level test. So, you know, this is the basement basically for hopping into IT from the gut. Started from the bottom, man, with the CompTIA A+. Um, this kind of breaks down the certification and the different parts uh, that you need. So mobile devices are 15%. Networking is 20%, hardware is 25%. Virtualization and cloud computing is 11%. Hardware and network troubleshooting here, if you check that out, it's 29%. So a lot of the stuff that we're going over um, is hardware in these first couple of lessons. This is the bare bones, like basics of what you need. And um, that's why we're kind of spending so much time on it. We were gonna hop into networking this week, but I figured we'd do some hands-on stuff, at least with the testing, so you guys kind of know what information is pertinent and um, you know, just make sure that you guys really understand some of these concepts because it's gonna be a big part of the testing coming up. These are some links for the introduction to hardware. Hardware basically is anything you can put your hands on. It's a device like a laptop, uh, a computer, PC, um, parts for the PC, parts for your laptop, um, and we'll go over a lot of that here. So the motherboard, the motherboard is basically if you're making a pizza, the motherboard is the dough. The motherboard is what you put everything on and it connects the pizza together. So the motherboard is pretty self-explanatory. I'm pretty sure everybody and their mother knows about the motherboard. You know what I'm saying? And here's a picture of that right here. Functions of a motherboard um, are basically just to control the bus speeds, to bind all the components of the system together and provide a master clock to synchronize the operations of the whole system. And then you can go into the motherboard architecture here. I think one thing that we do need to cover is uh, the BIOS. The BIOS is big. The BIOS is the basic input and output of the device. It plays an equally important role as a chipset in each main server. The chipset is basically what houses the CPU. Um, this device contains the working parameters of the system BIOS. It will be soldered and glued directly to the main server or plugged into the sockets for users to easily disassemble. So um, yeah, we'll go over BIOS a little bit more, but uh, definitely keep that in your mind. The BIOS is basically um, what controls the input and output of your device. Um, the CPU is also something that you wanna uh, really kind of focus on. The CPU is the brain of your computer. So the CPU and the BIOS are two different devices that um, are very pertinent to uh, the, the foundational knowledge for what's coming next in the course. The bus system, think of the bus system like just basically a highway. When you think bus system, think highway. It's a highway for data. Um, you transfer data over high speeds. Um, it will communicate with the processor um, and it supports the CPU. So it supports the CPU and processor are the same thing. So if you hear it, it's, it's anonymous. The bus system basically brings data to and from the CPU. And you can have a bunch of different slots for buses. You can actually add extensions, add more uh, slots. And that's kind of what these are right here. When you talk about the ISA slot, the ISA slot is an old slot. It's no longer on the motherboard. The PCI slot was the next iteration of it. And the PCI, PCI Express slot is the newest iteration of it. And that's uh, the fastest one. And it's the most pertinent because it replaced uh, the PCI standard. It, has, it offers more bandwidth. And bandwidth is basically the speed at which and the capacity at which the information is transferred across um, the bus system. Form factors. This is basically talking about the motherboard and you can see different types of motherboards right here. The ATX, the micro ATX, the mini ATX. Remember the ATX is the big one. The big boy is the ATX. And that's the uh, 12 inch 
that's the big boy. Then you think micro ATX, it's just a little bit smaller, about seven, eight, eight, seven inches. Then you've got that mini ITX, and the mini ITX is the small one. So whenever you think of uh, computation and whenever, really in computer science, when um, you think about like the names and the acronyms, a lot of times uh, the acronyms directly describe, so just use, try to use common sense. Like if you don't know what the, acro what the acronym necessarily means, if the first letter of, so in questions on the CompTIA A+, they'll ask you a question and they'll basically put the answer in the question. So they'll say something like, what type of mini motherboard do you use to, um, in this device, in this, and you will say, okay, I need this motherboard for a mobile device, a tablet, um, something small. And uh, which one is that? The mini. And they have mini in the actual answer of the question. So be cognizant of that. Use your common sense. A lot of the times, if you just think logically through a lot of these questions, then you'll be able to guess the answer. And uh, you might not necessarily you might not necessarily know the concept, but just from thinking logically, you'll pass the test. ITX just goes a little bit more. The expansion bus slots are the line connectors. Um, the long thin connectors provided on the motherboard near the back side of the computer. They use to connect all the add-on cards in a computer system. We kind of already went over that. They're basically the highway for information. And this is a picture of them right here. PCI Express slots. Remember uh, the PCI Express, that's really the only one that you want to focus on. Um, not the only one that you want to focus on, but that's the one that you want to be the most aware of because this is what most of the questions are going to be related to on the test. And you can see them right here. Here's a picture. If we go back to this picture, um, you can see the chipset. The chipset is this, uh, this black square to the left of the screen in the middle, kind of. Um, that's where you would put the chip. You can see... Uh, PCI slots right here. You can see the motherboard. You can see all the expansion slots, basically. There's no expansion slot in here, but all the, um, basically the outputs. You can see all the outputs down to the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. Here's the difference between the PCI buses and the expansion. It's not through the front panel. Processors, just know that the processor is a CPU, so if you hear it, it's interchangeable. Here's a picture of a processor, a different processor architecture. We'll get into it a little bit um, in more detail later on in the course. Processor components, cache levels. Cache memory is fast and expensive, traditionally categorized as levels that describe its closeness and accessibility to microprocessors. There are three general cache levels. Level one, or the primary cache, is extremely fast but relatively small and is usually embedded in the processor chip as CPU cache. Level two cache or secondary cache is often more capacious than level one and level two. And basically this is just memory. This is just, it, it basically controls like how your traffic, how fast your traffic goes based on how much memory you have stored. Um, it can be on a separate chip or a coprocessor and have high speeds alternative, alternative uh, system bus connecting to the cache and the CPU. So it's basically um, gonna be a separate chip connected with through the bus system. Um, that way it doesn't get slowed by traffic on the main bus system. So see it separates traffic for your memory. Um, L3 cache is specialized memory developed to improve performance of L1 and L2. So as you can see, as the levels go up, and pretty much performance will go up, you know, or it'll be a later version or a later iteration. And the same thing with letters and numbers. So level one is obviously the first iteration. Level two is the next iteration. Level three is the next iteration. And so level three will be the combination basically of one and two, and it'll have its own uh, performance benefits. So be cognizant of that when you're taking the test. Processor speeds, um, we'll talk about that. What does clock speed mean? It's a good indicator of overall processor performance. Though applications like video editing and streaming are known to rely on multi-core performance, many new video games still benchmark best on CPUs with the highest clock speed. And so basically that's just how fast your processor can process data. And um, you'll get some different examples of that later on. Processor width isn't too important, threading. Oh, 
Oh, this is a big one. Do more cores. So the core is basically what does all the processing on the processor. It's like its own small computer CPU inside of the CPU. And this enables more efficient simultaneous processing of multiple tasks, um, like multi-threading. Multi-threading is just a processor processing multiple tasks at the same time, basically. As opposed to back in the day, you used to go and do one thing on a computer at a time. Um, because of multi-threading, you can do multiple things. You can have a bunch of different tabs, a bunch of different apps, everything open on your computer. At the same time, your computer can be processing multiple things. So when you talk about cores, you hear cores a lot when you talk about processors. If you've ever seen commercials with processors or chips, they'll always talk about, we have this many cores or that many cores. Um, it should be noted, however, that the more cores in the CPU don't necessarily mean a higher clock speed, the speed at which programs load and run on the processor. So in general, a faster clock speed means applications can load and run fast, but a high core count means that a computer can run multiple programs or switch between programs at the same time with little trouble. So be cognizant of the difference between actual clock speed and what your core does for your processor because it's not necessarily the same thing. And people kind of find it, uh, a lot of people think of it synonymously, but it's not, it's different. CPU socket types, you can go through these. Basically, what the CPU socket does, um, they're like puzzle pieces that determine how the processor fits um, into the motherboard. Each socket type has a specific shape and a set of pins that match with the processor. So this is important because each socket is different for each company that makes chips or motherboards. So each motherboard and chip has to be compatible. And I think that's the biggest thing that uh, we haven't talked about in this is that uh, standardization. Standardization is when... Um, you can take a monitor, like a computer monitor, like this monitor is a Dell monitor, and I'm using it with a Mac laptop because of standardization, because there's an HDMI input on the back of the uh, on the back of the monitor, and then there's a output on my Mac. So standardization is when you can take things from different pro you can take products from different manufacturers. And you can use them just like they were all products from the same manufacturer. Um, a lot of components on computers are not like that. So if you have a motherboard, you have to make sure that you get the right CPU for it. You have to make sure that you get the right RAM for it. You have to make sure that you get everything compatible with whatever motherboard that you get. The motherboard is the basis for everything, and then you build on top of that. Once you get your motherboard and your CPU, you've got your brain, you've got your dough for your pizza that's going to connect everything. You're good to go. So definitely be cognizant of, of pins. Um, you don't have to do that. It's not It's not that big of a deal, but know that you definitely, um, different socket types are gonna go with different processors. So anytime you get a machine or you're building a machine, make sure that you get compatible parts. Cooling, cooling is just, everybody's had a computer that's gotten hot. Um, and when you touched it, you're like, damn, this shit, I could fry it. I could fry an egg on this shit. Like that's uh, why you need a cooling system because you could damage your CPU really bad and that'll destroy you, basically your computer um, if you don't cool it. So cooling is important. You can see you have the fan right here. The fan is uh, what most computers use for cooling. You have some, uh, right here is the heat sink. The heat sink basically distributes the air around uh, and out, the hot air out and the cold, cool air around your uh, case in your motherboard. So the heat sink and the fan are um, synonymous with each other in, in a lot of in a lot of cases. Um, thermal paste, uh, it eliminates the rolls. It's not really, I mean, uh, the main role of thermal paste is to eliminate air gaps or spaces which act as thermal insulation from the interface area in order to maximize heat transfer and dissipation. It's just another form of cooling. Um, liquid coolers are pretty cool. You can see a liquid cooler right here where uh, computers actually have uh, liquid running in and out of them to keep components cool. Expansion cards or add-on cards, these are what you uh, use for your PCI connection. This is where the bus comes into place. Uh, as you can see on the left, you have uh, an expansion card with an AGP connection on the bottom. And on the right, you can see one with a PCI connection. 
The one on the left is a deprecated, obsolete um, version of an expansion card. We don't use AGP for connection anymore. We use PCI. In an expansion card, you can add a bunch of different things. Uh, the most popular expansion slot standard is PCIe Express, as I just said. Um, a video card to the right uh, is the video card. This is just um, on the back here, you have the expansion card. So on the bottom of it, you see the, the PCIe Express where you, uh, where you plug it in. On the left side of the video card, you see the output for HDMI. And basically what your video card does is it basically just controls the output of video to your monitor. And um, it is where you plug in. So it's basically where you plug in your ports, your HDMI, like it has an input for HDMI here, has DVI, um, has a fan to keep it cool. Uh, interface cards, as you can see, this is where your network card is. Your interface card controls your um, internet. So this, as you can see, the ethernet port right there, whenever you think of a NIC, um, and they're not calling you a nigga, it's just the NIC. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's the NIC. So um, go ahead and make sure that uh, you understand that the NIC card controls your network connection. So your ethernet cord plugs in right there. When you hear like ethernet, another term you're gonna have to kind of get familiar with is LAN, local area network, um, local a LAN adapter, a physical network interface, and by similar terms, it's a computer hardware component that connects a computer to a computer network. The chip, which is installed on a computer so it can connect to a network. So basically you can see the chip um, right here in the middle, then you can see the port, and you can see the PCI connection that's gonna connect it to that, uh, to that bus system. Storage, volatile and non-volatile. Volatile storage is basically storage that is gonna erase when the computer powers off. So whenever there's no power, the storage gets deleted. That is RAM, that's your random access memory, which is basically like your short-term memory for your computer. That's an example of volatile storage. Non-volatile storage is a hard disk or a um, SSD, which is a solid state drive. And uh, we'll get into the difference of a SSD and a hard disk uh, here in a minute. And all these things like hard disks, uh, flash drives, optical storage, which is like DVDs and stuff, um, cloud storage, network storage are all um, forms of non-volatile uh, storage. This storage, this is what we're talking about with the hard drives. This is the magnetic storage. And this is basically like your uh, run of the mill everyday hard disk that you see that uh, makes when you power it up, it makes noise. Um, you can hear the fan running, I mean, not the fan running, but you can hear the actual disk spinning inside of the hard disk. Um, it's a little bit bigger. They're a little bit cheaper than uh, solid state drives. Uh, they contain platters that house the inside of an air seal, on the inside of an air seal casing. Um, data is written to the platters using a magnetic head which moves rapidly over them as they spin. Hard drives are available in two types, solid disk and uh, spinning disk using magnetic storage. So I'll show you a picture of the hard disk here in a second. So this is the hard disk. This is what the inside of it looks like. You can see um, the read and write head, the spindle, the platters. So the read and write head is writing the information to the platters. The arm is controlling the head and the actuator is controlling the arm. And you can see here, um, the save files are saved on the disk, and you can see there are multiple disks uh, here. There are like three disks, it looks like, um, connected together. So this is just your every everyday run-of-the-mill hard disk. There's a lot of these, and you can find these in PCs. You can find these um, as external disks. You can buy these, and they're usually cheaper than uh, solid-state drives. Uh, storage capacity, you have... Uh, you have gigs, you have uh, you have megabytes, you have kilobytes, megabytes, gigs, and then terabytes. So terabytes are basically a thousand gigabytes. That's the biggest form of storage that you really need to worry about in a commercial sense, or even really in a production sense. You're really not handling that much storage unless you're working for a company that is like a Fortune 500 company that has like 5,000 employees, but 
Um, then you'll get into like petabytes and things, but a terabyte is a thousand gigabytes. A gigabyte is a thousand uh, megabytes and a megabyte is a thousand kilobytes and so on and so forth. So basically, um, gigs are a big form of storage. They're going to, it's going to take a long time for you to transfer a gig as opposed to you just transferring, you know, megabytes uh, worth of storage. So if you're trying to transfer a terabyte of storage, it'll take you all day. If you're trying to transfer gigs, it may take you a couple hours. If you're trying to transfer megabytes, it may take you, you know, a couple of minutes, depending on how big the storage capacity is. Um, local storage devices. So we'll talk about different type, types of local storage devices. You can use magnetic storage as your local storage device. And basically, that's just storage that is available on your device. So if you don't have to plug anything up and you can just save things directly to your device, it's using local storage for the most part. Now, new devices with new software utilize cloud storage to kind of expand your local storage, but um, local storage is still a thing. Whenever you look at a computer, you'll see the um, local storage amount on the actual, um, on the box, it'll give you the storage amount. Uh, random access memory, we talked about this already. This is basically like a little stick. This is a hardware device, and it is the short-term memory of the computer. These are different types of RAM, and you can really, so anti-static precautions, one thing about RAM, when you're installing RAM, you want to make sure that you don't have anything static around you, and you want to make sure that you don't have any like foam or styrofoam. You don't want to make sure that you don't have styrofoam, plastics that are carrying a, a charge. You want to make sure that you're not carrying a charge because um, you can really ruin memory with uh, electromagnetic charges. So any, like any type of shock to your memory will can destroy uh, the data on your device for most uh, devices. Never touch the metal conductors of a memory module. And that's basically the gold parts on the stick of RAM here that you see on the bottom that actually connect to uh, to the motherboard. Most RAM is volatile. Rem always remember that term, volatile. So that means once it's once there's no power to the device, that memory is lost. You want to use your hard drive. So hard drives and solid state drives are what you want to use mainly for your um, long term storage of data. DDR speeds, um, as you can tell or with most acronyms, the higher the number gets, the faster it gets. It's basically, um, if you had a magical mailbox where you can send and receive letters really quickly, DDR speeds are like how fast you can send or receive those letters. All right, so here's RAM, all right, memory reliability, ECC, storage, risers. We already kind of talked about solid state drives. Here's a picture. Oh. Okay, this is a smart bus controlled with a microprocessor that allows you to add up to 15 peripheral devices to computers. These devices can include hard drives, scanners, printers, or other peripherals. Oh, the picture is. Probably should have put this on top. Don't worry about it for now. It's not, it's not on the test at the moment. Um, RAID storage. Definitely get familiar with RAID storage. So, RAID is this will be the last thing that we cover, and then I'll kind of let you guys go. Um, once you, uh, and you can go ahead and take this test, look over it. You can use the internet, a lot of this stuff. Uh, I would just advise, please don't just go on chat GPT and, you know, just get the answers and <laughs> think that, you know, you're gonna comprehend this because this isn't really for a grade. In reality, this is really for your comprehension. You know, you're only cheating yourself if you don't go and really dive into this and um, make sure that you know the knowledge and comprehend it because you're gonna utilize it pretty much everywhere you go. So um, RAID, this is the last topic that we'll cover. This is a form of storage. So RAID storage or redundant array of independent disks is a data storage virtualization technology that combines multiple physical disk drive components into one or more logical units for data redundancy, performance uh, improvement, or both. So redundancy. Redundancy just means that if this device fails, there's a backup device, there's a failover device. So redundancy is if I'm running, no, redundancy is basically like 
if I'm driving on the road and the police are chasing me and they throw out a strip and they pop my tires, redundancy is, imagine if your wheels, instead of your tires, those wheels that just got popped, instead of having to run on those or run flat or anything, imagine if you had a backup set of wheels that deployed as soon as those wheels uh, got punctured and you had a failover set. So basically that's what redundancy is, is that you have a backup for uh, whatever you have running. And this is a big term in networking, but right now we're using it for storage. So it's a way of storing the same data in different places on multiple disks, uh, hard disks or solid state drives. So this could be a magnetic disk with spinning plates or it could be a solid state drive. And the solid state drive, I, I didn't uh, cover this before, uh, the solid state drive um, doesn't have any moving parts. I covered it in the course, but I didn't cover it uh, just now. But the solid state drive, the difference between a solid state drive and a hard disk drive is that the solid state drive does not have any moving parts. And that's big. That's a key component. So uh, the solid state drives to protect the data in case of drive failure. So this is specifically for a drive failure. A RAID system consists of two or more drives working in parallel. These can be hard disks, but there is a trend to use SSD technology. The SSD is a more modern form of technology, and that is probably the best, uh, so the best solution. If you want to utilize a solution for storage, you want to use SSD. The only drawback for SSD basically is the cost per gigabyte. Um, the cost per gigabyte on a hard disk is lower than what you would get on an SSD. Um, so RAID, and then we'll talk about the different uh, versions of RAID. So there are many different levels of RAID. The ones that you want to be aware of for the test, the CompTIA A plus coming up is uh, RAID zero, disk striping, strip box, stripe volume, volume stripe, <laughs> stripe volume. With RAID level zero, the data is split across drives with no data redundancy. So RAID, it has no failover. RAID zero has no failover. RAID level zero improves read and write performance while writing to multiple drives at the same time. You need a minimum of two hard drives. So I could technically take these two hard drives that I have right here and I could turn them into a RAID storage disk if I were to combine them and um, have them basically read and write data to both of them at the same time simultaneously. RAID 1 uh, is disk mirroring, duplexing. Duplexing and mirroring are, are um, synonyms. With disk mirroring, the data is written to both drives involved in the mirror in order to provide data redundancy. Windows 7 supports disk mirroring. So the same data is written to both drives. Instead of having different data on either drive, you have disk mirrored on Either on either disk. You have memory mirrored on either disk. RAID 5, disk striping with parity. With RAID 5 volumes, the data is written to multiple drives along with parity. Inform me that it's used to help recover data if a single drive fails. RAID 5 volumes need a minimum of three disks. So RAID parity. So with parity, it's basically helps you, it's basically something on your drives that will help you um, that will help you recover your information in the case that a uh, drive does fail. Uh, RAID 10, mirror disk striping. RAID level 10 is also known as RAID 1 plus 0. You know, basic math there because it is a disk stripe. It is a disk striping while mirroring the data written in the stripe. So basically what it's going to do is it's going to split the data up, but it's also going to mirror the data, which is, I know it's kind of a crazy, you know, concept, but just know that whenever you think of RAID 10, you have both um, you have both capabilities from RAID 1 and RAID 0. So you have mirroring as well as striping. And striping is basically just putting different data on each drive, saving diff writing different data to each drive. All right. Local storage networks, um, we talked about network attached storage, um, which is basically like a hard drive. A NAS is basically like a box that has a bunch of different hard drives in it. So it might have like three hard drives in it with four terabytes of storage on it. And what this NAS is, is it's, it's powered. Um, it has a regular power, but it also has um, a network cable, like an ethernet port on the back of it. So you can connect it to your network 
and anybody who's on your network now can connect to this storage device. So you can store a bunch of stuff, like way more than you would store on a regular hard drive or SSD because you have multiple different hard drives that you're um, storing data on. So you'll have, you have four, four terabyte drives, you essentially have 12,000 gigabytes of data. And then you can set these up um, as like RAID for RAID storage. The rest of the information is on the test, all the important information that you need to know. Uh, definitely go back and the test is pretty much made to for you to do your own uh, do your own research basically. So it's going to take you on different paths as you're looking up answers for this test. It's going to take you down different roads and you're going to you know grow on your on your knowledge. So definitely take the time to utilize the information that's on the PowerPoint and also utilize the uh, information that you have available to you with the internet because ultimately um, the biggest thing in IT that people are unaware of is that you have to be able to find information. Um, the biggest the biggest flex is being able to find some you know obscure piece of information that can uh, help support or uh, solve a problem. Like that's a huge thing is just being diligent and seeking knowledge. So um, when you take this test, definitely dive deep, seek some knowledge. And, um, you know, if you run into a problem, you know, figure out how to problem solve. Well, I can't find necessarily pertinent information for what I, what I have right now. Utilize the resources available to you. So, um, yeah. So I appreciate you guys showing up today. Um, Vito, Nigel, Damon, you know, so I love y'all. That was all I had for today. I didn't want to hold you guys too late. I want to give you guys a chance to um, go and kind of dive into this into this test. I'll shoot it over into the group chat. And uh, you all have a good night, man. I appreciate yeah, you guys showing up. Thank you, bro. Thank you. Appreciate you, bro. Yes, sir. All right, y'all.